In this video, I'm going to cover cholinergic antagonists. So let's get right into it. Cholinergic antagonists can be divided into three groups. First, anti-mascarinic agents. Second, ganglionic blockers. Third, neuromuscular blockers. So let's start with anti-mascarinic agents, also known as anticholinergic drugs. These agents block primarily muscarinic receptors, thus causing inhibition of muscarinic functions. One of the most well-known medications that belongs to this group is atropine. Atropine's primary sites of actions are the following. Eye, GI tract, heart, salivary, sweat, and lacrimal glands. Now, anti-mascarinic activity of atropine in the eye results in relaxation of ciliary muscle, which causes dilation of the pupil, also known as medriasis, inability to focus visually, also known as cycloplegia, and unresponsiveness to light. So, ophthalmic preparations of atropine are used before an eye exam or eye surgery, as well as to treat certain inflammatory conditions of the eye. However, because of its long duration of action, other anti-mascarinic agents, such as cyclopentolate and tropicamide, are preferred over atropine. While cyclopentolate and tropicamide can produce madriasis that last for hours, atropine's effects can last for days. Another feature of atropine is that it blocks M3 receptors in GI tract, which results in reduction of GI motility from stomach to colon. This translates into prolonged gastric emptying and lengthened intestinal transit time. At higher doses, atropine can also effectively block M2 receptors on the SA node and AV node, which produces tachycardia. Heart rate may increase by as much as 30 to 40 beats per minute. Lastly, by blocking muscarinic receptors on salivary, sweat, and lacrimal glands, atropine produces dry mouth, dry skin, and ultimately causes body temperature to rise. The next very well-known medication in the anti-muscarinic group is scopolamine. So scopolamine, unlike atropine, has a much greater effect on the CNS, as well as longer duration of action. For that reason, scopolamine is one of the most effective medications used for prevention of motion sickness and post-operative nausea and vomiting. It is available in a patch formulation that provides effects lasting up to 3 days. Another medications in the anti-mascarine group that I want to talk about are ipratropium and thiotropium. Ipratropium and thiotropium block muscarinic acetylcholine receptors without specificity for subtypes. This results in decreased contractility of smooth muscle in the lungs, which in turn leads to bronchodilation, and reduction of mucus secretion. Thiotropium and ipratropium are administered by inhalation for maintenance treatment of bronchospasms in patients with COPD. Ipratropium also comes in a nasal spray formulation, which is often used for treatment of rhinorrhea, which is runny nose. The main difference between ipratropium and thiotropium is their duration of action. Thiotropium is a long-acting agent that is dosed once daily, while ipratropium is a short-acting agent that typically requires up to four times daily dosing. Another medications that belong to this group are used for treatment of overreactive bladder. These include tolterodine, darfinacin, solifenacin, oxybutynin, trospium, and fesoterodine. These agents have varying selectivity for the M3 receptor, which is the main receptor involved in bladder function. However, the overall efficacy among all of these is very similar. Last but not least, I wanted to briefly mention two muscarinic blockers, benztropine and trihexafenidyl, which through their ability to suppress central cholinergic activity, were found to be very beneficial in treatment of Parkinson-like disorders. Now, before we move on to the next group, I wanted to make sure everyone watching this video remembers their ABCDs, which will help us to remember anticholinergic adverse effects, where A stands for agitation, B stands for blurred vision, 
C stands for constipation and confusion, D stands for dry mouth, and S stands for stasis of urine and sweating. Now we can move on to the second group of cholinergic antagonists, which are ganglionic blockers. The main agent in this group is nicotine, which is a main component of cigarette smoke. Although nicotine is a cholinergic agonist, it is also considered a functional antagonist because of its ability to stimulate and then block cholinergic function. So nicotine acts on the nicotinic receptors of both parasympathetic and sympathetic autonomic ganglia. Effects of nicotine result from increased release of neurotransmitters such as dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine, just to name few. Nicotine is a non-selective. It stimulates and later depresses autonomic ganglia. For example, nicotine stimulates CNS, which at high enough doses can lead to convulsions, and then it depresses CNS, which can lead to respiratory paralysis. Also, by stimulating adrenal medulla and sympathetic ganglia, nicotine increases blood pressure and heart rate, but at higher doses, it can cause blood pressure to fall. In GI system, nicotine increases the motility, which can lead to nausea and vomiting. Last but not least, use of nicotine in any form can cause addiction due to CNS stimulation that produces increased alertness and search of well-being. Overall, other than to help people quit smoking, nicotine is not very useful in clinical practice. Now, let's switch gears and let's talk about neuromuscular blockers. Neuromuscular blocking agents simply block the cholinergic transmission between motor nerve endings and nicotinic receptors on the skeletal muscle. So, if we zoom in on this part where nerve ending meets the skeletal muscle fiber, you would see these nicotinic receptors to which acetylcholine can bind and induce their opening. Opening of these channels lets sodium ions to enter the muscle fiber and trigger muscular action potential. The potential travels first along the surface of sarcolemma, which is the excitable membrane that surrounds those cylindrical structures known as myofibrils. Then the action potential travels through T-tubule system, which penetrates into the fiber. And then the arrival of action potential causes calcium to be released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which finally leads to muscle contraction. Now, let's see all these steps in action. So, action potential causes release of acetylcholine, channels open, sodium goes in, triggers another action potential, calcium gets released, and muscle contracts. It's that easy. Now, neuromuscular blocking agents work at this junction here by interacting with these nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. We can divide these agents into two groups. First, non-depolarizing agents, and second, depolarizing agents. For all of you who need a quick review of membrane depolarization, I strongly encourage you to watch my short 3-minute video about action potential. So, let's talk about non-depolarizing agents first. These agents are competitive antagonists. They bind to acetylcholine receptors, but they don't induce ion channel opening. What that means is that they prevent depolarization of the muscle cell membrane and thus effectively inhibit muscle contraction. In clinical practice, these agents are used to facilitate mechanical ventilation and tracheal intubation, as well as to increase muscle relaxation during surgery, which allows for lower doses of general anesthetics. Generally speaking, non-depolarizing agents are not absorbed from GI, and that's why it must be injected, usually intravenously. Time to onset of action is rapid, usually less than 2 minutes. Once administered, these agents paralyze small, fast contracting muscle first, that is eyes, face, fingers, then larger muscles of neck, trunk and limbs, and lastly diaphragm. On the other hand, these muscles recover in the reverse manner that is diaphragm first, then limbs, trunk, and so on and so forth. The choice of an agent typically depends on the desired onset and duration of the muscle relaxation. And just a side note, a clinical duration of these agents is a time measured from administration to recovery of 25% of baseline muscle strength. Now, some of the most widely used agents in this group are the following. Cis-atracurium, 
which has clinical duration of about 90 minutes, pancuronium, which also has clinical duration of about 90 minutes, rocuronium, with clinical duration of about 40 minutes, vacuronium, which also has clinical duration of about 40 minutes, and lastly, atracurium, with 40 minute clinical duration as well. Now, when it comes to side effects, atracurium causes histamine release, which results in fall in blood pressure, flashing, and bronchoconstriction. It also has toxic metabolite, called laudanosine, which can provoke seizures, especially in patients with impaired renal function. This is why atracurium has been largely replaced by its isomer, cis-atracurium, which fortunately is much less likely to produce the same adverse effects because its metabolism is independent of hepatic or renal function. Therefore, cis-atracurium is often used in patients with multi-organ failure. Now, vecuronium and rocuronium are metabolized by liver, so their action may be prolonged in patients with hepatic dysfunction. But overall, they are safe and have minimal side effects. Lastly, pancuronium is excreted unchanged in urine, and one of its main side effects is increase in heart rate. Now, let's move on to depolarizing agents. So, depolarizing agents act as a acetylcholine receptor agonist. They mimic the acetylcholine, however, they are much more resistant to degradation by acetylcholinesterase, and therefore produce persistent depolarization. Now, the only depolarizing agent that's still used in clinical practice is saxinylcholine. So, saxinylcholine binds to the nicotinic receptor, and unlike the non-depolarizing agents, it actually causes the sodium channel to open, which results in membrane depolarization. Now, because saxinylcholine is resistant to acetylcholinesterase, it causes prolonged depolarization, which leads to a transient fasciculations and finally flaccid paralysis. This is referred to as phase 1 block. Now, eventually, sodium channel closes and membrane repolarizes. However, due to continued stimulation by saxinylcholine, the receptor becomes desensitized to acetylcholine, thus preventing formation of further action potentials. This is referred to as phase 2 block. Now, saxinylcholine has a rapid onset of action and therefore is commonly used to facilitate rapid sequence endotracheal intubation in critically ill patients. It's also sometimes used to provide adequate muscle relaxation during electroconvulsive therapy. Following intravenous administration, saxinylcholine causes complete muscle relaxation within one minute. The effects typically last up to 10 minutes due to rapid redistribution and hydrolysis by plasma pseudocholinesterase. And that brings us to adverse effects. In patients deficient in plasma pseudocholinesterase, or patients who have genetic variation of this enzyme, saxinylcholine can lead to prolonged apnea. Next, prolonged depolarization caused by saxinylcholine leads to continued flow of potassium into the extracellular fluid, which can result in hyperkalemia. Now, in patients with normal potassium levels, this is usually not a big issue. However, in those with elevated potassium levels, for example due to burns or large tissue damage, Saxinylcholine can cause serious EKG changes and even in severe cases, a systole. Lastly, in genetically susceptible patients, saxinylcholine can trigger rare and potentially fatal condition called malignant hyperthermia. Symptoms of malignant hyperthermia include severe muscle contractions and dangerously high body temperature that can reach as high as 43 degrees Celsius. And with that, I wanted to thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed this video.